The title for this about to be very interesting session is Guilt, Love, Longevity, Ecology and More. We are delighted to... and has written 30 books of fiction and non-fiction which have been translated in around 30 countries. He was also a professor at a prestigious institute in Paris for 20 long years and a visiting professor at the New York University, San Diego and Texas. We are delighted to invite you, sir. massive entry into the workforce and more tolerance of homosexuality. As the discussant, we are elated to have Dr. Sadna Shankarji. She is an IRS officer of the 1987 batch and is currently the Principal Director General of Income Tax, Legal and Research Department at Delhi. Apart from various positions in the Income Tax Department, she has worked on deputations in the Central Ministries of Health, Home Affairs, Parliamentary Affairs, Overseas Indian Affairs, and Civil Aviation. In her journey as a civil servant, she added the dimension of writing and today is a prolific author and blogger. I would request the esteemed panel to please unfold the conversation and we must go ahead with a round of applause. Is this, oh yeah, okay. Uh, Namaskar, good morning everybody. Thank you so much, Siddharth. Uh, as uh, he introduced our guest for today, Mr. Pascal Bruckner, uh, you must have realized that he has a huge body of work. When I was reading about him, I discovered that in about 50 years, you can correct me on the number, in about 50 years, he's written about 40 books. So that is such a big body of work. And uh, I had to actually do a lot of research and try and understand uh, the topics and the various issues that he's covered in his writing and his thinking in his long career. And I wondered, should I start this session from his earlier books or what should I do? Then I decided that I will start the session from his most current book to talk because where he is today, when he's written something in Drive, which has been published in 2022, the reflection of his entire work will come in his current book. So our talk and discussion is actually going to go backwards and we're going to begin with his first, uh, his latest book and as time persists, per permits, we'll take, uh, discuss his ideas in his earlier books. I hope that's okay with you. Yes, so I'll uh, start with his book that came out in January 2022 and it's interestingly, I'm not taking the French name because I might pronounce it wrongly. When uh, you s translate it in English, it is In the Friendship of a Mountain, a short treatise on elevation. And what I read about the book is that it's a la kind of, uh, he goes back uh, and talks in his friendship with the mountain about his youth and it is more uh, exposition of his ideas on the journey and philosophy of life. So, Pascal, I'd first like to ask you, please tell us a little bit about your ideas in this book and why did you pick up a mountain to kind of talk about the philosophy of life? Well, first of all, thank you to the Festival of Bhopal for inviting me. I'm just discovering the beautiful city of Bhopal and very happy to be here uh, today with you. And uh, Sadna, I'm sorry I wrote so many books in my life. Had I known I would meet you today for a discussion, I would have refrained from writing. No, 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 not at all. Yeah. It's just but, well, amazing, that's all. You know. It's done. And uh, so why the mountains? Because I, I, I love the Alps since I'm, I'm a kid. I was brought up in Austria and, and Switzerland. Uh, as uh, 
as our host said, and um, um, I got used to, to like um, phenomena like uh, the snow, the big cold, as you have here in the Himalayas, and I started to mountaineer uh, almost every year. I, I ski in the winter time and I climb in the summer time. And of course, it's it's a uh, it's, um, very peculiar way of life. And if you don't like the mountains, so you, you're very unhappy when you raise above uh, the plains. But uh, um, I think mo mountain is a kind of, of school for life because you you climb a summit and then you go down. And it's totally absurd. It doesn't make sense. Why climbing if you have to go down afterwards? And when you climb a mountain, whether it's, it's, it's a trek or it's an escal escalade or... Uh, or alpinism, um, it's very hard, you suffer a lot, you sweat, uh, your body aches everywhere, and then, and then you ask yourself, why on hell do I do that? What for, if I, uh, in, in two hours I will go back down? And I think it's a nice metaphor of life, uh, because you, you were born and you will die one day, so why, uh, what's good about living? if you have to die one day, but uh, I think the trip is worth doing it. And um, one of the main experiences of uh, mountaineering is the conversion of uh, suffering into um, a kind of um, superior pleasure. Because uh, you, your body, uh, your body uh, aches, you, you, your legs are... Uh, uh, are in great pain, your back is in a, is in a great pain, but you, you have um, set yourself a goal. You, I have to, to go uh, uh, to this uh, mountain, I have, I have to do it. I cannot recede, I cannot uh, fail. Well, sometimes, of course, you're, you're not fit enough to, to climb, so you, 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 uh, you, you, you stop and you, you, you will come back another day. Um, and when you arrive on the summit, uh, even a small one, you don't have to climb 3,000, 4,000 meters, but even a small summit with effort is, is a huge victory. But it's not a victory over the mountains because you, nobody can beat a mountain. This is an absurd um, uh, uh, saying, but uh, it's a victory over yourself. It's a victory over fear, over uh, tiredness, over exhaustion, and uh, if you have uh, made this climbing with friends, which is the most, most, most often the case, you are very happy to have succeeded, and it's a kind of a, uh, a great moment. Um, and then you have to go down, and uh, the descent is uh, more dangerous than the climbing, because of course you're tired, you're more relaxed, and you may fall into a crevasse. You have this word in English. You may you may s s slip, and um, most accidents happen when people go down the hill, not when they climb the hill. But of course, in India you have beautiful mountains too. You have the, the greatest mountain on on earth, so you know what it is if you go north and uh, and uh, make treks in in Simla or Darjeeling and in places like this. But it's, um, yeah, it's a metaphor of life, and it's a way for me to remain not young, but to rejuvenate myself. The activity of mountaineering, physical activity. Yeah, mountain. physical activity okay. with a goal. And the goal is to, 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 to go up to the, to the summit and uh, escalate in itself, uh, escalating a mountain, is a kind of, um, it's not like reading a book but it's very close to reading a book. It's like reading the rock. So okay. you, have a, you have a wall of rocks, and uh, you have to understand exactly where to put your hands. To be able to climb up. Yeah, when yeah. To, where, where to put your, your feet, to find an, a balance between uh, right and, and, and left, and then to, to um, catch a, a small uh, rock uh, above your head, and then to proceed slowly but steadily uh, with... Um, to the summit. Not to the summit, but to the next step. step. Because okay. there, there are many steps before the summit. Okay. And most of all, for me, the mountains also, 
is uh, one of the most beautiful uh, sceneries on Earth. Okay. I'm not a sea guy, I'm not a, a man of the ocean. I'm, I'm, I'm scared on the water, so okay. you know, I'm sorry about that <laughs> for sailors, but uh, and, uh, watching, uh, watching uh, a chain of mountains uh, really is, is an enchantment to, for me, because when you are um, in, in the Alps or in the Himalayas, you, um, your gaze, you always look uh, above yourself. You know? Right. It's not like looking in front of yourself, you look above yourself. And that, uh, that gives me a feeling of elevation. Coming to elevation, uh, your book in 2019 is about what you call, you call it, the perpetual euphoria on the duty to be happy. In, in your mount, book on mountains and, or your idea about mountains, it's all about reaching an elevation to feel en enchanted or to feel happy. But in this book, uh, you have said that happiness has become like a you know, duty for everybody. There's too much emphasis on being positive and being happy. So uh, are you trying to say that negativity and uh, unhappiness has its, and grief have their own place? I mean, there is, yes, everybody now wants to... Uh, happiness has become a destination in itself. So is your argument that grief and negativity also have an important place? Is that your main argument in the book? Yes, in the end, yes. And um, after World War II, I would say in the 60s of the late century, the Western culture has caught the disease of happiness. So suddenly happiness has become a, a motto mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the final destination of uh, everyone's life, and, which of course is, is, a, is a major change compared to previous centuries because in, in the Christian uh, Europe, uh, the obsession of people um, before the French Revolution in 1789 was not happiness but salvation. You had to save yourself, you have to save your soul in order to uh, attain paradise, heaven, uh, after death. And of course, um, happiness on earth was sacrificed uh, for this um, ultimate goal to be uh, saved and received by God and his sense if you believed in God, of course, which in that time was uh, the, the common rule. And then little by little in the 18th century, during the Enlightenment, um, earthly pleasures uh, were, became predominant over the concern for eternal life. And then uh, that, that's how happiness became our main concern, but in certain obsessive ways that um, it turned into, as I said, a kind of uh, illness, a disease. The, um, the will to be happy here and now, uh, every hour of the day, without any kind of negativity. And um, so it turns out that uh, we, in the West, in France also, but in, especially in America, where the right to happiness is inscribed into the Constitution, um, uh, Happiness has become uh, um, a duty, almost a duty, a moral duty which you cannot escape. And you know, in, in companies you have a chief happiness. You also have this now concept of the gross national happiness index instead of Yes, a national GDP, happiness index, national exactly, happiness. exactly yes, yes. yes. And it always puzzles me to see that, but well, I respect uh, people's attitude and um, Yes, I think we, we, we see happiness as a kind of a constant condition, which is not the case because most of, most of the times in our daily lives, we're never happy or unhappy. We just keep living. It's an ord ordinary day with um, small satisfaction, small dissatisfaction, and you could not answer the question, uh, are you happy or not? Uh, I don't know. And you know, there is... Um, a very interesting um, question which, which I uh, uh, try to decipher in my book is how are you? Okay. And so how are you um, in, 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 in the Western world and in France, how are you um, it was uh, first a medical term. It, it, it was meaning something very casual, I'm sorry for that. How many times do you go to the toilets a, a day or a week? And if you had a regular transit, 
it meant that you were in a good health. So it was a medical term, and then little by little, it became a, a, almost a philosophical term. And uh, when you ask this question, people usually answer it good, and then uh, it's just a way to uh, um, just way to start a conversation. But if you had to answer this question, how are you? You should sit down and think about yourself. How is my health? How is my mind? What are my expectations? Am I really so happy? Am I not a little unhappy? Am I not uh, disappointed by life? Uh, am I not uh, expecting something too high for me? So it would be a kind of uh, um, self-examination which would take hours. And when you ask someone, how are you? If the person says bad, you say, oh no, why did I ask that? I will have to listen to, to this person's complaint and uh, it can even take 10 or 20 minutes. So, um, so of course, that's why this, this question, how are you, is, is so uh, symbolic of our situation. Uh, but tell me, what is the problem if, as a society or a culture, people do aspire to be happy? I mean, what is, why do you feel that that is like a disease or that's something a negative to being, mm. trying to be happy, you know? Well, it's not, it's, it's not negative if you, uh, accept those moments of negativity you just mentioned uh, before. But um, the goal to be happy excludes a priori all kind of negativity. It means that uh, happiness is like a house you built. Mm -hmm. So when you're young, you, 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 you build the foundation, then the, the, the ground floor, and then by uh, getting older, you, you, you build the first floor, uh, second floor, and then the attic, and then the roof, and then you live in the house of happiness. But this is just a fairy tale. It, things do not happen that way. So um, um, happiness is, is uh, rather uh, intermittent. It's, it cannot be permanent. Permanent state of being. Yes, okay. yes it's a, if it's a permanent state, if happiness is a permanent state, it's still, uh, it gets mixed up with boredom because it, it's everyday life if, you, if, if you're... Uh, uh, have a constant moon, mood sorry, every day. So happiness will confuse itself with uh, ordinary life, so it won't be happiness anymore. Because in my view, one of the um, characteristics of the happiness, it is a, uh, it's a moment of enchantment, far from uh, daily uh, concerns, and daily worries, daily uh, anxieties. And uh, for this moment to happen, it needs to detach itself upon the ordinary current of things. And um, so if we want uh, um, 24 hours happiness all, day, all life long, uh, it, it, it might be uh, very boring. And you know, um, some people want happiness and uh, other people wants, uh, want a destiny. And having a destiny is not exactly the same thing as, having, as being happy. Having a destiny means that you're ready to confront uh, uh, pains, uh, danger, climb the mountain. yeah, climb, climb a mountain, mountain. risk, okay. and 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 daily happiness may, might be tantamount to a uh, uh, very dull and uh, uneventful life. Okay, that brings me your concept of a dull and boring and uneventful life. Brings me to your next idea that you've explored is longevity in your book in 2019 and you call it a brief eternity the philosophy of longevity and uh, much longer than they did say 50 years ago and you've talked very hopefully about the older phase of life you call it the Indian summer after 60 so, do you think that longevity, and we are only going to continue like as medical science is going to progress, we are only going to live longer. You know, humanity is going to end up living longer. So, do you think in that uh, sense it's going, it's going to be a boon or a curse to really be living that long? Well, for, for, uh, for those who live longer it will be, uh, of course, a, a bliss. Mm -hmm. But for the young, younger generation it, it, it might be a curse for, for many different reasons. For in, but first of all, the good news is that those young uh, ladies sitting there will probably, they, they might live uh, 100 years. 
if they uh, all the young girls born at the beginning of the century uh, are doomed or bound to live a hundred years, which of course is rather good news and, it, and is something absolutely new in the history of mankind. Just one, uh, one, fi one figure. In uh, 1655 or 6, when Louis XIV, which was one of our great, king, great kings in France, was uh, crowned, uh, life expectancy in France was 25 years. 25 years. In the center of every village, there was a cemetery, which means, which meant something very simple. Death was at the center of life. You lived to die. So um, it, it explains a lot of things. First, it explains the intensity of the religious feeling. As your stay uh, on this earth was very short, you, 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 you didn't have time to spend in, um, in, in casual pleasure. You had to uh, preoccupy yourself with the salvation of your soul. So when you, people you used to, be, to get mar married at 15 or 16, most women died uh, during uh, uh, child delivery. Uh, families where many the people had seven, eight, nine, ten kids. Most of those kids died uh, before the age of five. And so there was, there was this obsession of, um, of, of life after death. And then little by little, with the progress of science and medicine and uh, agriculture, People started to live longer, and now in, in France, life expectancy for women is 85, and for men, 79 and a half. Even if with, with COVID, people died sooner, because we had, like you had here in India, um, many old people who died. And um, but is it is it a bliss? Well, of course, if you if you are 50, 60, 70, knowing that you can have uh, 30 more uh, years of uh, life in, in good condition, it's a bliss. But, but it's, it's also challenging in, in a way. But it's extremely challenging, yes. It's extremely challenging because you have to reinvent yourself um, totally. When most of our... Um, uh, mental frame expect us to uh, slow down after 50. So now think, uh, a man or, or a woman of 50 years old nowadays has the same life expect expectancy than the total life of, or, of a man or a woman in the 18th century, 30 years more, in good conditions. And it, it's, a, it's a revolution. It's a revolution, so we have to reinvent the philosophy of aging how to age gracefully without being handicapped. We have to reinvent the philosophy of work. Is it reasonable to, be re to retire after the age of 60 if you still have uh, 25 years to live? Is it normal to um, put our uh, financial um, maintaining on the shoulders of younger generation? Do uh, our children or grandchildren want to pay for our vacations? If you, if, for instance, in Europe, if you take um, low-cost uh, planes, they're full of uh, hyper-vitaminized retirees who go on vacation. They go to India, they go to China, they go to Cambodia, to Africa. They sing, they dance, they're, they're in very good shape. But this money, where does that money come from? From the younger generation who work for the elders. And so that's why we have to rethink totally the condition of retirement. And we have to uh, postpone the age of retirement. So now most countries do that. Uh, in 2018, Vladimir Putin, who is famous now for something else, yes, yes. decided the age of retirement at 65, which was very badly received in, in, in Russia because most people die at, at 67 of alcoholism and, and bad medical condition. But now in France, the project is to put it at 65. Okay. And uh, I think it, it's, it's more sound. And um, seizing all um, work activity 
may also bring many people to, to depression. You and I are writers, so you know, writing never stops. True, that's one no, good no. thing about it. Yeah, yes. that's a good thing about writing. Yes. Like a, every artistic uh, activity, mm. you never stop because yeah. your mind is uh, constantly mm. thinking about a new story, a new topic, uh, or, um, uh, painting new new thing if you're a painter. For instance, in France, the oldest and most famous painter we have, Pierre Soulage, is 100. And one years old, and one years old is 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 famous. He has a museum for himself, and uh, of course, this is an ideal. It's it, yes. it, it, it's a wonderful prospect. It's not the case for everyone because uh, the flip side mm -hmm. of uh, what uh, I said before. You said what is the flip side? The flip side is um, uh, longevity does not prolong youth. It prolongs Life. the the old age prolongs disease. And it brings with it all kind of calamities like the Parkinson disease, Alzheimer disease, neurodegenerative diseases, which of course is not the best prospect. So, you know, it's a kind of, like every kind of progress in history of mankind, it has a good and bad sides. You've said in the context of this book somewhere that this is the first time on the planet that the young and there are so many generations that are alive together. So, uh, what do you see in this perspective when there are so many generations, the young, the young adults, middle age and old age people living together? What do you see as the their, uh, you know, between them the collaboration and the competition that would is likely to emerge even as lifespans increase? Am I my question is clear? Yeah, very yeah. clear. Yeah, yes. then it's a very good question, and it, 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 it's one of the main issues of of uh, uh, today's France politics. So how to uh, maintain the conversation between the elders and, and the youngest. Okay. And, and it's not always easy. First of all, there is this um, feeling of many young generation to have... Uh, yeah, yes, there is this feeling for, for younger generation... No? Okay. Sorry. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. To work for uh, lazy people who are on, on vacation all year long. And um, the, the vocabulary changes also. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very hard to speak with a child. I have two grandchildren, mm -hmm. and, and uh, also uh, a daughter who is very young. I uh, had many lives, like all we all have now. And um, e even uh, to maintain a conversation, you have to have your own GPS, inner GPS, your own computer in your head, because the words don't mean the same thing anymore for young generation. True. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I don't mention, don't even mention the, those people, men or women, who remarry at the age of 60 and 70, who happen to have sometimes kids. Yes, very so young. So they, yeah. they, they, the new kid is younger than the elder, your eldest son or elder, eldest daughter. So it, it you know, it, it intercrosses, it makes a, it makes a, a kind of, it looks like a telephonic standard of the old times with all kind of lies, of lines will, uh, will intertwine. And um, so I think we, we, we need soon translators to speak between generations. Nice. People uh, will, try, will try to translate between uh, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 70s, and etc. Going forward. Before I open, I just want one question because uh, which is on your views on the, the climate change debate. In, you have written, um, that's the last thing I will uh, open up uh, before I open up to the audience. Uh, you re wrote in 2011, The Fanaticism of the Eco Apocalypse. And uh, in that, your main idea was that ecological catastrophism, the talks of the approaching climate disaster, was creating a dominant feeling of fear. My question to you is that in 2020...
tradition we have uh, this, uh, uh, this tradition of um, messianic uh, apocalypse mm. which says that uh, the end of the times have, has come and now we have to prepare for, uh, for the huge collapse and uh, you have to remember that in the year two, 2000 many people and among them there was a very famous uh, uh, grand couturier, I don't know how to say, uh, 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 fashion maker Paco Rabanne said mm. that uh, in the night of uh, 1999, 2000, yes. Paris would be destroyed by uh, stars falling from the sky. Of course, nothing happened. In between, this uh, Paco Rabanne uh, guy died. So uh, we are very familiar with Apocalypse, and it's even written in our holy books, in Apocalypse selon Saint Jean. So we have, we have uh, re real concerns, but I don't think that... Uh, Fear is the best way to confront them. No, that is a point well taken, yes. Thank you so much, Pascal. Thank I think you, Sanna. We okay. can, if there are any questions, uh, please, uh, uh, it's open. He, sir. Yes, please pass the mic to Raghav, sir. Pascal and, uh, 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 and Sadhana ji, there was a very lively debate on the subject of happiness and what is happiness, how much should one pursue happiness. So thank you very much for a very enthralling discussion on that. Continuing on that, uh, my question for Mr. Bruckner, based on your personal philosophy, your understanding of uh, Europe, of European society, what are your views on the subject of mercy killing or euthanasia? And I read an article in The Economist magazine you know, because we talked about that after, you may live 100 years, but you may not necessarily be healthy and uh, happy. So it's a very interesting subject. And so suppose society lived, you know, everyone could live 100 years. But suppose society, uh, government and societies gave us permission to take our lives and to inject ourselves, so like the economist had this thing about an Australian who went to Switzerland, because Switzerland allows this, injected him, uh, before he had his glass of beer, listened to Beethoven's Furulise, and then got himself injected and died. So are you, do you think that that is the way society should make some rules for that, so that people who are critically ill or who sense that they are not well, should be able to eliminate themselves so that they are not a burden on their children and society, or should it be just left open uh, without rules? Oh, that's a very touchy subject. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, we all we we are all torn apart about this, especially when we get older and you know, where as as the age uh, increases, you 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 can't uh, you can't help thinking about your own death. How how would I like to die and how? How, do, how horrible will that be? Um, so in France, people are extremely divided. And uh, for the moment, we're, we're in a kind of legislative vacuum. We, we don't want to legiferate about this. And I think this is a, a, a better approach than the Swiss or, or the Belgian approach, which authorizes people to, uh, to, to kill themselves. Well, of course, if you are in, in a critical condition, in, in the ultimate uh, um, phase of your life, and if, you, if you're in a terrible suffering, I think doctors will uh, offer you spontaneously to, to end uh, your, your misery and uh, will ask you the permission to uh, terminate your life. But there is an example which strikes me very much and which is close to the one you just gave. It's a, a Belgian um, writer called Hugo Klaus. He, he is considered, he, he writes in Flemish, which is close to, to um, uh, Netherlands. Netherland. And uh, at the end of his life, he, he had the Al Alzheimer. So he, he realized that he had lapses of memory more and more. And he, his wife and his publisher, they, he decided to, uh, to end his life. So he went to an institution in, um, I think it was in Anvers, in, in, uh, in Belgium. So as exactly as in, in, in exam the example given by the economist, 
He had a beautiful classical music played. He had a uh, cup of champagne, a glass of champagne. He smoked a last cigar. He lay down and he had an injection. And he said it was a peaceful departure. But, well, I admire this very much. I don't know if I would be able to, to, to do like this. But I think this has to remain um, a personal decision. Because if you allow euthanasia, you know, uh, if it, it becomes authorized by law, many families would be tempted to end up with the ancestor or the ancestress just to get the, the, the legacy or just, you know, to get rid of a, a disabled person uh, who is a burden to the family. So we have to be extremely careful about uh, legiferating about this kind of, of subject. Um, it's so touchy that uh, it's a very div divisive topic. Okay. Next question, please, from the uh, gentleman sir. wearing a hat. Uh, sir, Pascal, sir, I would like to ask you one question. I had been to Paris two years back, and I saw a lot of foreigners, especially Africans, Chinese, and Asians. So I would like to know the, what is the impact of the other population on the local population. Is there any inter-community release or everybody is living in harmony? Well, <laughs> yes, you, you all ask very touchy questions. Of course, yes. <laughs> of course there are tensions. Well, it depends, it depends with what community, you know. Um, uh, yes, this, this, this brings us, uh, there are tensions when um, communities uh, with a strong religious tradition come to France and do not abide by the um, French uh, rule of uh, secularism. As you know, perhaps in France we had a long fight for centuries between Catholicism and Protestantism. There were horrible massacres. It was a civil war which lasted for three long centuries, which left terrible marks in, 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 in the history of the country. But finally we came to a social peace um, and uh, religious uh, uh, appearance in France is related to discretion. When you walk in the street, people don't have to show their own religion. You know, they, they we are just ordinary citizens, and the religion is uh, related to the, to the privacy, which is not the case in, in, in most um, uh, outside countries and uh, which brings tension, especially with a Muslim part of the population coming from Maghreb, which is North Africa, and from uh, sub-Saharan uh, um, countries like Mali, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and so on. So it would be a lie to say there are no tensions. There are many tensions, especially since the, the integration mach machinery doesn't work anymore because we have unemployment, because uh, uh, French society is not so sure about itself as it used to be and uh, it's even one of the main topics of the current uh, presidential election. Uh, there is a huge, uh, there is a major feeling of being invaded by, by immigrants. And I know you have also this problem in India with people from uh, Bangladesh or, or other countries. And, but uh, France is a, is a small country compared to yours. I think it's uh, hardly bigger than Madhya Pradesh. So, um, yes, there is a space. It's not so the fact that people come from other countries. The, the main challenge is this one, how to turn an African, uh, an Arab from Maghreb, uh, people from Afghan, uh, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, how to turn him into uh, an ordinary French citizen, regardless of the color of the skin, just uh, the mentality, how to turn him into a good French Republican. And uh, so far, um, the challenge is not met, and it's, uh, it's a real issue. So the, the tendency in France, as you notice yourself being a student there, is a kind of um, a, everyone retreats in his own community. and. Uh, so the uh, big cities are recreating ghettos, as uh, you have in America, ghettos of people coming from uh, from Africa, from uh, from North Africa, from uh, uh, Middle East. I would say that uh, the two communities with which we have 
no major issue so far are the uh, uh, Asians, people from China, Cambodia, Vi Vietnam, and the Indians. We have now a strong Indian community um, in, in the north of Paris. And uh, as far as I heard, we, we have no major issues. They, they melt very well into the common population. They're very entrepreneurial. They succeed very well. And of course, they uh, have strong ties with India. No, so the, the main issue now is with the uh, Muslim part of the, of, uh, of the migrants and the young generation also of uh, people from Maghreb and, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, thank you so much, Pasilji and yeah. Sadnaji. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Such an insightful you so session. Much. I would now like to invite on stage the director of the Bhopal Literature and Art Festival, Raghav Chandra, sir, to please present a memento to our author and discussant as a symbol of love, respect, and gratitude on behalf of the Bhopal Literature and Art Festival. The memento is a painting based on tribal art, which has been made by Padmashri Bhuri Bhai Ji, a beautiful painting right there, and a mug to go along for our discussant. An interesting and insightful session indeed. Thank you so much to our esteemed guests for the session.